So last, a year ago, July, I saw a tweet from mystery writer Anne Cleves. I don't know if you've watched the Shetland series, but um, that's when I really got to get a sense of what the place was like. And she announced on Twitter about an early bird for Shetland Noir. And I, I thought, well, that's interesting. And so I, I think going to Shetland was always out of the question for me. But I clicked on the thing and uh, signed up. And then immediately my, my credit union called me and said, what the heck did you just do? And I tried to explain them and I'm going to this place in the middle of nowhere. I got booked right away and it was almost amazing that almost everything was booked out a year, but I was able to find a couple of places and I was ready to go. But it's like, where the heck is Shetland? Now I had flown over Shetland, you know, those little planes that are on the back of the seat in front of you showing where you are flying somewhere. And I had flown uh, Icelandic from Seattle to Reykjavik and then from down there to Berg and then Trondheim. So when I was, the little plane was flying over Shetland, that was the closest I was ever going to get to Shetland. But to give you an idea, I, I flew from Seattle, uh, landed at Heathrow, and from there I had to take a plane to Aberdeen, and then from there I would be in Larrick. So it's quite a quite a, a trip getting there. Um, and uh, of course, I left uh, Seattle two hours late, missed all my connecting flights, uh, but I was fortunately rebooked right away. But I had to spend the night in Aberdeen. Uh, in the in the I think I got there at 1030 at night and I had to hide in a little place because they closed it down. There was no place to stay in Aberdeen because Elton John was having his last concert. So <laughs> there you go. So I did finally get a flight the next day on Logan Air uh, to Shetland to Somburg. It was, it was a lovely flight and it'd been a long time since I flew over open water. I have flown to Hawaii from uh, the Seattle area, but this was open water. So that was very interesting. So I arrived late, uh, but I was in Shetland. So the next step, I have no car. I'm going to be staying in Lyric. So I took the bus out. And this is my first experience to get an idea of what this place looks like. Uh, this is the, the normal bus that you take from the airport. It stops off at all these tiny little places but I got a sense of what the land was like for the very first time. And all this time, I'm also thinking about those boys from Norway that were going to be serving on the Shetland bus. What this must, did this feel foreign to them? I think if they lived on some of the outer islands on the West Coast, they probably would have felt quite at home. There are hardly any trees at all. Although I was told in Neolithic time, the place was heavily forested. So it's uh, it was my first glimpse of of the 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 city outside. Larrick is the largest place there. And I honestly don't know the the population, but there it was. So I got into town uh, just to show some pictures of the town because Larrick was also important for naval operations, very secret too. Uh, in the Shetland Islands. So I, I was up on what they call Head Hill. And it's, it's a hill that looks down into the harbor. And uh, this, I stayed at a youth hostel, a wonderful old school. It was wonderful. And I highly recommend it. I was right across the street from a fantastic garden. And uh, I could only book for three days there. Being late, I, was, I could only stay two. And then I went across the street to this place and stayed right up there at the very top. On the waterfront the first day, I wasn't late for all the plant stuff that anyone who was going to be presenting. So I got a chance in the evening. This is June. I got there June 14th. So this is full sun really all the time. Um, this is, everybody goes to this place. If you've watched Shetland, this is Jimmy Perez's house. Uh, I think the people are maybe slightly annoyed, but they're okay. They have a wonderful bookshop in town. And the library, the bookshop, and the, the art center went full thing on this. So I prior to go, I did a little sleuthing of my own to see if there's any possibility that I could get on a panel. And I was so thrilled that I was accepted. And I think it's because I was writing about the Shetland bus. It's like, what does this American know about the Shetland bus? And we had a wonderful uh, panel. This is David Bishop. He writes about crime in Florence and 1450s. They apparently had a police force. And uh, next to me is Lisa. She's from Toronto. She writes future stuff. 
And uh, the other one there is Jackie Call, and she's known as Dr. Noir. And we had probably one of the best monitors. And of course, I could talk about you sing. So it was an incredible time. I am so grateful. The library went full out. I had a one wanted poster because I was on a panel. Uh, for some reason, I was named the ogre, but that could be a relationship to Norway. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, after I got back, I was stunned to get an email from Billy Moore of the Shetland, you know, the Scalway uh, Museum. And they wrote something up about me in the local newspaper, which is amazing. And the funny thing about this thing, it was a great honor to be mentioned visiting the museum. But the other part of the article you don't see is that it was another visitor to the um, Scalway Museum that was uh, from Iceland. And his parents, his ancestors had come to Shetland 1,100 years before. And they had all the records of that family. Uh, the bride and groom had, had run away from Norway and got hitched in uh, Shetland. And then they had to run further to go to Iceland. But <laughs> This person, they know their history in Iceland, which I think is amazing. So once this is all over, I had one day to really run around before there was only two flights out of Shetland to Bergen twice a week. So I had one day to go over uh, the Shetland bus in Skalway. So where is Skalway in relationship to Larrick? Because I didn't have a car, I had to use the bus system, which was great. I mean, you can see more stuff on a bus watch people get on and off and you get a sense of the area and i think i want to go to writing conferences all the time in scotland now because i just love listening to the scots talk about writing but anyway uh that's where it's located and we went by bus and got over there now before i left i had emailed um i was trying to like make sure i had all my plans laid out originally i was supposed to meet with bill moore he goes by billy moore but I had asked, you know, the bus route to the wrong museum, and they referred me over to Scalway, and Billy Moore answered my email. And I was like, fangirl, because I knew who he was. He is the son of Jack, Jack Moore, who worked on the Shetland buses, both the fishing boats and uh, the submarine chasers. And so I was so embarrassed. I had found out how to take the bus when I got there late. I made my way out there. By noon, he was gone. But I did tour the museum, talk to people, and got home disappointed. And he emailed me about two hours later. And he said, I'll meet you again. So this is what it's like in Scalway. And it started to rain a mist a little bit, but this is actually from his house in Scalway. He was born and raised there, went away to England for several years, and then came back. So the town itself, this was actually the, I think the Viking capital in Shetland. So it has very old, um, you know, links to the past. And the, the housing there is probably from the 1700s, maybe 1600s, but beautiful. And I just sort of walked my way up to the museum the first time. And this is an important structure here. It was built, I think, in the 1500s. And it's a long story, but everybody hated the guy. And eventually he got hung. So it's kind of a ruin. And they've been trying to work uh, on it all this time. But this is definitely something uh, the young men that were on the Shetland bus would be very familiar with. In fact, uh, when my second time there, I got there early. So I went into this little place to get some my first Scots scones and really good coffee. But this is how it looked during the time when the Hitra was there. This is the Hitra right in front. So here is the same building here. There is the castle ruin. And these up here are probably temporary buildings. I understand there may be a few that still uh, survive, but this is for personnel that were involved. I mean, this was a secret operation, but they had to uh, you know, have things there for people. One of the things was fun is that the high school had put on a couple of panels down on the water. And I think it does a very good job of showing what it, where everything is. First of all is the Prince Olaf Schlipway, which is right here. I probably saw the house, but I was walking and probably missed it. There's gardens there. Uh, but this was an important place. This was headquarters in Scalway. Uh, another interesting one was this place here, this hut, which is where they made fake IDs. And the other one is the Scalloway Castle that we just saw. And it was an ammunition dump during the war. 
the kids also created a really nice mural of you know where you were literally you can go straight to Bergen from um from the Shetland. It's just astonishing and why it was such an important place for places on the west coast of Norway. And the kids also showed some of the, the boats that were lost in various places. The bear home is pretty famous. Um, and showing the fishing boats, Luna House. And then I didn't get a chance to go there. I'd love to go there. So I finally made it to the museum and I met Billy Moore. And he's just turned 81, I think. And he could probably run circles around me in the room. I mean, he's just really very energetic, very warm, very kind. But he had the privilege of knowing all these people. He grew up with the people of the Shetland bus, including Leif Larson, many, many people over the years. And so he ended up that day was my guide through the through the museum. It's very small. Uh, I worked at a county museum, and I would say that mine is larger than theirs. But one side has local history, the other side is all Shetland bus. But the quality of the exhibits are really great. So they talks a little bit about uh, Jack Moore, and I'll read it a little bit. It says he was born in Holm, Orkney in 1899, and he moved to Shetland not long after. His father was a blacksmith and engineer in Scalway. On leaving school, he joined business uh, to work with his father. He did military service in 1918. And then his primary interest for boats and diesel engines, which is very critical to why he got involved with the Shetland bus. Throughout the 20s and 30s, he played a major role in financing and fitting Gardner diesel engines to many of the boats of Shetland's fishing fleet and that of Northeast Scotland. So, it, and the other thing I love about their exhibit there they have it in English and they have it in Norwegian because the thing that my takeaway from here is this great love and affection that Norwegians have for Shetlanders and vice versa. Uh, in fact, uh, Billy emailed me about two weeks ago and he said the Queen was there. Queen Charlotte was there on a private visit. They shut the museum down, knew she was coming, and she took a tour of the museum, the Queen of Norway. And uh, he said the thing that was kind of funny, though, you know, there were no visitors in there, but there was a Norwegian outside. And she got so excited because the queen was there. She saw her go into the museum. So here's an example of the Hitra, which was restored. And uh, just an amazing story. They also focus on some of the most important people in the story uh, of the Shetland bus, and one of them is Eitzheim. And each time does appear in Yusing several times, but I, I had all the records of where they were. They were sometimes near Freya, sometimes near Fuda. So it made sense in fiction that uh, the Hitra or the Hesse would be up there. And there's, there's more stuff on it, but it's, it's very beautifully laid out and how everything come to be. Another piece of the exhibit uh, was about the boat. So the early years, you know, fishing did not have shipped ashore. Um, that really came after, I think, for fishing boats, maybe even as late as the 1950. But but these guys needed to be somehow have some kind of a contact. So uh, this is a very nice thing explaining how the fishing boats worked, what kind of receivers they had. Obviously, the Hesse and Hitra and Vigra were all you know top line. In fact. My parents lived near Annapolis, Maryland, and when I was early years of using, I went down there to look at boat models, and they had a model of submarine chaser, and in the archives, they have the plans for these boats, and they are named by their number of how they were produced, and that's part of the Naval Archives, but I think it's housed at the Naval Academy. Again, another nice exhibit there about how it worked. Another piece of there were these personal stories that really struck me. Uh, this there's several pictures of, of refugees coming over, and one of the pictures I think it's the same group that's uh, on the wall. She was a 14 year old when she came over. She comes over now. She's about 75, and again this this gratefulness and appreciation for Shetlanders, the Shetland bus rescuing them. Uh, it, it's it's very um, heartfelt. Grandkids and members of the Shetland bus come from Norway and from other parts of UK. This other one on the right, this handsome young man, he left his papers with his girlfriend 
Um, this is a sort of typical thing. If he was on shore, he would have to show this. And uh, he took off on one of the um, one of the you know excursions, events, whatever they're going to do mission. And the boat was lost. He'd lost his life, but this was left behind. Uh, the really fun part too is uh, they try to show what the interior of one of the fishing boats looked like, like um, like the Bergholm. And one of the funny things is not funny, but you had to have this inside your uh, wheelhouse. So over here on the left, it's on the wall. But you had to say that you know you any any kind of contact with the enemy will you be met with death? And then the Germans realized a few months later, wait a minute, you need to say with German. <laughs> uh, they, they didn't have the Norwegian right. Uh, and a friend of mine, he's a brilliant maritime um, painter. And this is a painting, a drawing he did of me a long, long time ago. So I would understand how the thing worked. The wheelhouse is always in the back. The, uh, the fish holds in the middle and the full school is here. And actually a friend of mine is Alaska, Alaskan fisher. She grew up on fishing boats and I have scuttle in there. And she said, I never heard of scuttle. I don't think, and I started panicking because this is the last word in the audio book for brizzling. And a uh, friend looked it up. Scuttle is something definitely. It's this little piece right here. Um, you would climb down in the cruise quarter, but it's kind of like a hood and we'll keep water going down. She just said, well, we just got wet. So fishing in Alaska. This is another part of the of the uh, fishing boat that would be on there. They would hide these machine guns into oil drums, which are very common on fishing boats. Nets and um, oil drums are very common on Norwegian. They try to disguise these boats as much as possible when they came over from Shetland. And there's more on Shetland Wise, which is always fun. So we went and after that, he wanted to show me the waterfront. And then I was going to take the bus home. And he said, Don't, you said, you're not going anywhere. And I said, what? He said, no, we're going to go to Lunavo. So we spent time looking around. And this is what Skalway, this is Norway House in 1942 to 45. Today on the left, it's they use it as a gym or something like that. But there's so many historic pieces around Skalway. It's, you know, you should do a walkabout. Definitely go to Skalway if you ever make it to Shetland. And then another important piece uh, is the slipway. The slipway uh, was built to accommodate the boats so they could work on them. I think Jack Moore's uh, office is to the right of this building. Um, and so it's been in uh, disrepair, but they started a campaign about two years ago to raise money to fix it. And what I found interesting was the uh, North Traffic of Sea Traffic Museum in Televog is one of the principal people raising money for it. So they are going to restore it. But this is how it looked when it was under construction. You can see the, the layout of the, the village. It's being built here. And of course, when you go to the waterfront, this very famous memorial that was, I think they built in the 1990s. Um, it's very moving. It shows the ship. And every year during um, May 17th, there is some sort of ceremony going on, honoring those who lost their lives on doing Shetland bus operations. Some couple of people were actually attacked, you know, by German airplanes and died of their wounds. Others just were lost. Um, the, some of the stuff that was here, Billy was laughing because um, they had a couple of Norwegian crews come in here, meaning um, cruisers, military, naval cruisers came in and they left some uh, things in memory. But each one of these stones at this uh, memorial comes from the village of the person who was lost. Very moving. So where the heck is Luna Vo? So um, by now it's starting to splatter a little bit in rain, but we took off. Uh, we got some coronation sandwiches in the middle of nowhere because once you start leaving Larrick and Scalway, you're just out in the middle of nowhere. A lot of sheep, a few Shetland ponies. And uh, there is something that's, I don't see, you can see them. Sometimes in here you can see where they cut peat, but they also have these little hills like this one and this one. They don't have trolls in Shetland. They have trowies. And they live under these grass mounds and they come out and play the fiddle and dance. And you could get in trouble, but mostly you end up like, you know, not quite like Rip Van Winkle, but kind of wishing what happened kind of thing. But that's their local thing. 
So this is Luna Vo. So literally going out on this road. I mean, in some places it was barely a, it was a one lane, but you could hardly do a two lane. And sometimes there were sheep on it. So imagine setting up operations here. You have about 40 young men. Um, there's nowhere to go. And uh, they're kind of like in the middle of nowhere. Now, this manse was built in the early 1600s. And there's a church that's associated with it. But it is so isolated. But they felt this was a good place to be. A lot of things that are left over from the operations there. This was a building where they stored munitions. This is part of a wharf that uh, is still standing there. Um, Billy said this is machinery left over for lifting boats uh, in the area. But there is nothing out there. So you get inside. And this was amazing because this is a private home now. Uh, they do sometimes do a little bit of bread and breakfast. It's owned by the Airwoods. And then what's interesting, I was told that one, I couldn't remember who was who, whether it was the wife or the husband. They have a connection through their family to SOE Norway. So it's like, this is like a family taking care of this very special history of the beginnings of the Shetland bus. So it was such an honor that Billy arranged for me to come out there. We had tea out there. And then we explored the room in the house. So um, it's all about the Shetland bus. It's just comfortable. They had areas outside, I think, where men slept, but the mess was in here and uh, the, the kids could come in here because they were young people. They were 20 year olds, and, you know. And uh, this boat, I'm not sure if this is the author. This was involved with that um, attempt to blow up the turpits in uh, Trondheim Fjord. Uh, so you can see the little submarine here. And then this room, you know, the, the crew could come in here. The officers would be here. So they had all, they had, they had Howarth, another gentleman, and then a Norwegian cook. The only Norwegian on staff. But the whole house is Nor Norway. This, this was something on the walls that was dedicated to their connection. And at one point, the Hitra did come over here from Horton and uh, was here for some celebration. This window looking out here, this is from David uh, Hallworth's room. He chose this room because he could, like this was headquarters, he could look out and see all the boats out on the water. Upstairs, um, because it's been set up more for the family and also for bread and breakfast, this is the room that Leif Larsen would stay in because again, so many Norwegians always came back to Shetland, always came here, with their memories of this time in their lives. And this is looking out from one of the rooms on the second story. This is on the second floor. Again, always looking out where the boats would be. The other part of the place out here was a church. And the church is as is, is old as the, the mats. Um, there, it's a typical Lutheran church inside. We went inside. But the sad thing is there's nobody going to church out there. There's nobody out there. And uh, so they're thinking of selling it. So they have Shetlanders buried here, but they also have a number of Norwegians that were associated with the Shetland bus uh, buried here. And one of the pro prominent ones is uh, Haworth. And I'll read this. It says, in proud and loving memory of David Armin Haworth, naval officer, boat builder, and author, who from Luna House and later Skalway, ran the Shetland bus operation from 1941 to 1945, who loved these islands dearly and whose ashes were scattered as he wished on the waters of Luna Bay. Take home his name in your heart, for he was a brilliant writer, full of grace and wit and solid common sense. And I think to run the bus, you would have to have all that. And this is what it looked like in the 1941. So you can see the fishing boats out here. Uh, this is the manse. The church is way off here to the right. And some outbuildings, many of which are gone now. But it gives an idea how isolated this place was. 
So the next stop, I just, after this incredible day, all I had to do was now get on another plane and fly to Bergen. Because where I had several things set up, um, bucket list stuff, high which was going to Televog. I felt honored bound to go to Televog. And I was having trouble trying to find someone. I was going to be spending maybe $700 have a guide take me out there. I wasn't sure about the bus schedule and I didn't want to get stranded. And then at the last minute, my hosts um, from Trondheim, they had already invited me to their summer home in Bumbleau. And they said, we want to go too. So that was solved. So where am I going? So I'm leaving from Schaumburg and I'm flying over to Bergen. <laughs> this is what I saw when I got there. If someone can explain the question mark after Bergen, I have no idea why that's there. But I love Norwegian humor. You know exactly where you need to go when you see these signs. I'd stayed in a wonderful place in Bergen, a really nice place I found online. I'll definitely go back there. Uh, way up on the hill. It was a little hard to find the place. I finally hired a taxi because it was too daunting trying to get up there. But wonderful, wonderful. So I was going to be there one night. Again, this is I'm now here in June 20th. So it's the highlight. There's hardly any dark. And just wandering around where I was. It's just just wonderful. And trying to take it all in, trying to imagine. You know, I have those spy maps from Bergen still at hand and just trying to remember where, where is everything placed as I look at this. Just a wonderful place. Great coffee and uh, buns there. So finally, after that night, I went down the hill, um, left everything behind, of course, except my backpack, and uh, took off for... Uh, for the waterfront, and then over the Gestapo Museum. I had been in touch with a gentleman for two years while working on Grizzling, Jan Tor Ropid. Ropid. Uh, he's a retired professor of German from the university there. And we went back and forth for two years, you know, I'm asking advice on various things. So, um, so the museum is located in this building. This is how it looked. This picture is probably from 1949, 1950. But originally, Weizen III was built as a place for an industrial, and I believe it translates to handcrafts uh, organization. It opened April 1st. It was occupied by the 9th of, of April by the Germans. Never been occupied, but it had these grand plans for how it was going to be. And so trying to understand what it was like um, in you know, the time that I'm writing about, where is everything located? Actually, the National Sen is just, this is the Oli, um, Oli Bull um, Plus. And you go straight up to your left, it will take you up to the National Sen, which is their national theater. And of course, Greg put on concerts there and also the great, um, you know, Nora was poor, performed there, um, you know, Doll's House performed there years before. So it's amazing history, but this was going to be a grand place. So here's the German Gestapo right there, but I needed to understand how it works. So uh, when I got in there, the museum is actually on, a, I think the second and third floor, they say ground floor. And then they say first floor. So so we wouldn't get confused. They just said, we'll just say first floor for you because Americans are first floor, not ground floor. Uh, and this is fine, Arna Meher. And I spent a lot of time yakking with him and then finally met him in person. He set up the tour of the museum and then there was a special treat for me afterwards. So I tried to understand how does this thing work? Because one of the things, one of the first people I interviewed for using was a couple from Bergen almost 20, almost 30 years ago. She, they were the parents of a really good friend of mine. We all were re teaching reading in the schools here in Bellingham. And they told me that she worked in a restaurant. I have that in the dedication, the front of youth thing. And she worked in a restaurant with a bowling alley and they were Germans. Um, but this, this place had a bowling alley. And so they had cellars in the bottom. This was a drawing by um, Catherine Lobus, Lobus, and I, she is the head of the organization that runs not this museum, but another place that uh, was a concentration camp. You can visit that. It's south of Bergen. 
and she sent me a drawing of how it was laid out. So you went in the ground floor, our first floor, and the cellar, there was a kitchen, they had a bowling alley down there, and they also had torture chambers. Up above them are the offices, then a ballroom, and on this floor, they also had a restaurant. So you could go, an elevator took everything in the kitchen up to the restaurant. And then the Gestapo had these other two floors. And um, this is the, the state police. This is the part that runs the place. So I had asked my friend Barrett, who's 99. She gave me a lot of advice of what it was like in Bergen in, when she was there. She was born and raised in there, and she grew up across from the U-boat base. Essentially, it was all shipyards as a girl, and then the U boat base came in. So she had a lot of things. And she told me, I said, I know she got arrested for buying flowers for King Hoken. Uh, they, a bunch of kids were going to do that and march around the lake there. And they were all taken away from there. They took away their pass, threw away the flowers, and told the report to Viton 3 the next day. And I asked her before I left, I said, What do you remember about it? And she said, Oh, there, were, there I remember offices. So one of the things they showed me at the museum was they, you know, after the Germans knew they were going to be capitulating, they started throwing things out, burning whatever, any kind of records they had. But one of the things they found was an album. So here it is showing the floor, what the building looked like and all the different floors here. But this is from this album. And to me, when you see people in an office this looks like where i go pay my water bill for my city it just makes this more chilling about how a group comes in takes over your country takes over the municipality and runs it this is where you go maybe to pick up your gresson pass the gresson pass is what you need uh, to be any move anywhere around bergen or go south on a ferry because anybody who lived on the west coast was considered being on a border so Gresson Pass is a border pass. But the scenes in here, they're just so ordinary. But they're occupying your country. Some of them may be Norwegians that are working there. Sometimes they brought in, you know, brought in Germans. It's just so ordinary. And I think this is the most chilling thing about it. Here's what the uh, floor would look like. Remember, the ballroom is up there in our third floor. This was taken in 1949. But it gives you an idea that they're... You come up on the elevator and the food would be delivered to you. So people that worked in the office, members of the Gestapo, anybody could come here and get something to eat. They also had a ballroom. So I love these pictures. These are from about 1950. Um, but uh, they're showing, you know, this ballroom, you could have parties there. I mean, the Germans had parties, you know, and the bowling alley is in the basement. But then you get onto the upper floors where you're with the Gestapo. And then you see, um, my understanding is that a lot of these cells were covered up. But when they started, there's a lot of part about the building that's unfinished. And they're trying to raise money to maybe expand in the upper floors where many of the German officers uh, things were. But they keep the archives, I think, on this floor. Uh, but these were discovered. And they've got... Um, you know, plastic over them because behind there is graffiti. Some of the graffiti is from Norwegians who were held there. They be held there and then they go down the basement and torture them. It's horrible. Uh, but also afterwards, they have graffiti done by Germans who were arrested after the war. And these are some of the people you would have met uh, in the Gestapo: Willy Kesting, Johann Arndt. Uh, this guy I wouldn't want to meet in the dark. Um, and uh, Kesting, all these all these men were executed. They were tried for war crimes during the the legal what they call the legal purge after the war, and they were all um, executed for crimes. This young man was Norwegian, and he worked there. Um, I think he acted as an interpreter, but he also was involved with torturing people. And he was 22 years old when he was shot. The other part in the story, though, too, are the, the heroes that uh, were captured and held here. Uh, on this side, these are the ones that they took their own lives in the cellar to, on, to not give up anything about the groups that they were in. And these people died from torture. And I focused on him. I learned about Baron Shia 
pretty early on, I got excited. So I created a character in the Brizzling Code based on him. I just found him absolutely amazing. He, it turns out he just wasn't there teaching the kids, the deaf children. They had a group of deaf boys that he was responsible for. He came in January of 42 to teach, but he also was the head Nilord courier for the area, which is astounding. And I don't have the slide here, but uh, when he was his death was announced in the summer of 43, they had a national magazine called uh, Ten Tok Tala and Tan. And uh, they it was a national um, newspaper for the deaf that came out once a week. And they announced his death, but it was like, oh, we're so sorry. He was our favorite teacher and he died of pneumonia. That's all they could say because it's German occupied. You can't say anything. And after the war in 45 in September, there was a two page spread about all the stuff that he did. He was really active in the in Nilorg and he was found out. Outside is another chilling aspect. There's plaques to these gentlemen. I think there's four of them. They jumped out the window to not give anything away. So the hero of these people, you really feel it when you go visit these places. But the surprise for me is that they say, oh, we have a treat for you. We're going to the Taya group, uh, Musit. And um, this place is hard to get into. Some It's not open all the time. It's listed, but it's not open the time. So we walked over there. And the person, I'm sorry, I've looked everywhere for his name, but the person who was going to be speaking to me was a son of one of the men involved in this group. And when I say men, I should really say college kids. There was one high schooler in this group. So we went into the Bregan, we went back wandering around the old part of this, uh, the Bregan, where this place is located. And uh, the gentleman went up there into the, the room and I didn't know what he's doing. I was trying to get myself up here because we were climbing very steep steps. And what he was doing up on the left, if you look right here on the right, there's two holes in the door and hanging on a hook that the Germans never figured out was kind of like a, a U-shaped wire. You stuck the wire into the holes and just like a 1942 James Bond, the door opened. They had a mechanism on the other side. The Germans never discovered this place. They discovered it later when there was a hole in the roof, but nobody was there. But they never, it just creates a solid wall. So I got in there and this is Torian uh, Ropit. Uh, after the, well, not, so many years after the war, they established a museum trying to show the kind of equipment that they had here. They are cars, they are taught to the English. They are the ones who alerted them about the trumpets moving up to Trondheim. And um, I think at one point I heard it, they had something to do with the Bismarck, but I don't think that's quite true. But if you look over, this is the gentleman that gave it, he spent a whole 40 minutes with me explaining everything. And his father is in the group on the wall. But again, I'll have to find out his name. I have to ask them. If you look on the other side of this slide, there's a Murphy bed here that would fold down. So if you were going to stay there um, and be settling, you could you could sleep there. The room is very small. But this was a major place. And, you know, the Germans had what they called DRTs. They were direction finders. And they they would often they got to a point they're practically handheld, but uh, they'd be on top of a car going around trying to pick up signals. But just amazing. Afterwards, it was a fast dash because I only the next day I was going to meet my friends, so I dashed up here, went to the Resistance Museum that's over by uh, Hawken Hall, wandered around there. It's very well done. A lot of people go there when they visit Bergen. And then my last thing to do for the day, I had to take the uh, Hoibon and up to the top. Uh, the Germans used it during the war for sending up munitions and arms, but there is also a road that you can take up there. And people use it as a hiking trail, but there is a road that could go up there. And this is what it looked like in the 1930s. And you could, you look, I, I don't know, these houses here could be these houses here but the tunnels going up to the top and the wonderful restaurant that's up at the top. So I had to go up there. 
Uh, this is uh, this is the base, and uh, during the war it looked like this. They had uh, heavily guarded it. They had sandbags around it and stuff like that. So it was used during the war. People were allowed to go up there and ski and go to the restaurants. But you always had to have your pass with you. And here's some pictures of what it looked like in the 1930s. And when you got up to the top, you had incredible view. So since it was built, which I think is around the time of World War I, maybe just after, this was a favorite tourist place for locals. They would love going up there. They go skiing in the wintertime, they go to the restaurant, and then they would um, walk down. So a wonderful view of the area. And when you look in here, you can imagine German boats coming in here. Uh, the, the fjord areas are very narrow and uh, these huge battleships would come down through here and anchor in Bergen. It was a major, major place for the Germans. And just walking around the restaurant, it's a beautiful building. It was closed. Um, I don't know if they're, what they're working, if they're trying to restore it or what's going on, but there is places to eat. And this is what it would look like in the 1930s. This is a wedding party. So the restaurant was very, very popular with locals and you know locals going up there. And walking around, it's gorgeous. This is the goat shed. They have goats up there to maintain the all the uh, stuff there. So the next day was Televolk. And this was always high on my list. And I'm so grateful for my friends for driving out. Uh, Angkor, um, and Engar is from Melling on Bumbleau. And he had told me when I first met him in Trondheim about seven years ago that, yeah, he's from down there, you know? And people always ask me, can you understand him when he speaks English? Because he had, they, to him, their ears, he had a different accent, probably very similar to the Bergen accent, which is different from people in other parts of Norway. Um, but he, he said he wanted to go. So I'm so grateful. So where is Televolk? So here's Bergen up here. In the past, you would take a ferry from Bergen. I, I think you have to go here and come down through here and go around. And uh, Fauna Fjord, Fauna will end up being a place where all the women from Televog were taken for the, almost the duration of the war. They had no cars on um, Sotra during this time period. Fell was the area where the, they didn't quite have Gestapo headquarters, but they had state police headquarters, which is significant for how the place was found out as a Shetland Bess um, a place. But um, that's how you get there. And, uh, in the old days, it'd be all ferry. Today, <laughs> bridges everywhere. And what was striking to me is in the, um, so it gives you an idea when you get there, museum is here. And then across the way is the Tillavok. It's just delightful. And all the buildings you see here in some form were all built after 1949. What my husband was a geologist and he, I think he just loved all the rocks and formations. They're very interesting. So that was from the museum deck. And the town a little further up to the right, you're actually down, I don't know. I don't even think an eighth of a mile, but you're essentially down from where the main part of the, where the um, Tellas and other families were during the raid. But this is Jenny, uh, Joachim Guslam. I spent a lot of time on email with him and I can't find Jenny's name, I'm so sorry, but. Uh, when I was leaving uh, Scalway, because Billy brought me right into town, dropped me off at my uh, B and B, and he said, "Say hi to Ginny." So <laughs> I got there. She is the museum director. I'm so sorry, I could not find her last name, but she was just lovely, and she is responsible for raising money for the spillway, the slipway in uh, Scalway that they're restoring. It's a very good museum because I worked in the county museum, I'm always interested in how people tell stories. So again, they have their own wheelhouse of a boat. This is a, a, a boat, uh, you know, rowboat that was very similar, if not one of the ones that was used 
for the Shetland bus. These were built in, in uh, Shetland. And, be, and so agents use these boats. They were built in Shetland and sometimes they were powered with a, a really good um, a motor. Uh, and because it's the same style as Norway, as Shetland, Germans didn't catch on. That might be up to something or other. They have a lot of stuff again, all the, the skippers of the Shetland bus. But the interesting thing they were telling me is that always Televolk has been uh, focused on the men. What happened to the men? The men were marched away 16 to 20 years of age, 60 years of age. And then, uh, you know, they sent to Schatzenhausen and had a horrible time, but they don't really focus on the women. So this is Marta Tella and her husband, Lawrence, and her son, Lars Tella. And then Overvit was another family that was involved with uh, they started sending before it was even Shetland bus. They were sending people over to Shetland on their own. And then it became a well known as a place that Shetland bus could come in there. But they were involved with North Sea traffic from practically the beginning. And um, anyway, they're now telling the women's story because it's also a heartbreaking story. These women were housed first, they were sent over to a, 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 a high school. And at one point they were, they separated the older kids. Uh, the mothers went with the older women and their babies, but anyone over age six had to stay back. And it was really hard for the mothers. And during the fall, they would get Red Cross letters from Schatzenhausen. And during that first fall, so many of the men died. And this was young sons too that died. So they're telling their story now, but it's a, it's an amazing place. So this is what it would have looked like uh, in 1930. So you would come in here, you could walk in an hour, ride your bike over to Spielepuden, which is one of the ferries they had there. A ferry did come in here and could eventually take you to Bergen. But you can see how rugged it is. And you, when you got to this side, you would call over and have someone row you over because there were no bridges during this time period. All this was blown up by the Germans. So here's Terboven, uh, different SS officers planning the destruction of the village. These are the telehomes. So after we were done with the museum visit, we also, um, Joachim, um, oh, one of the things they gave me is an amazing book. They have done a um, exhibit with a museum in Lydis. Lydis was a horrible, horrible thing where the whole I mean, it's just disgusting. And um, Tel Aviv was known as the Lydis of the North. Uh, when the word word didn't get out for several months to the general world till the summer of 1942. So all this happened April, April 30th uh, until the women were moved in May. But um, so this word did not get out, but Lydis happened seven weeks later. And it was horrible. I mean, they literally shot every single person, including babies. And so the both museums have now done a book, which they gave me, which is amazing, talking the similarity of the stories. The Germans were always careful with Norwegians. They always thought of them as, you know, Nordic brothers. But in 1942, Germans are realizing the teachers are on strike. The churches are refusing to have, you know, NS preachers. And there's all kinds of groups that are happening and Germans are starting to get tough. But anyway, he walked us through, these are just remains. They're just hidden remains of foundations of housing. This is a cellar that was not discovered by the Germans, but this is an important place. It says, this is the location of the clubhouse, which was built in the 1930s. So actually they had just built a whole bunch of new buildings for the little village. And, um, uh, all this would be completely destroyed by the Germans. It said in the 30s, women, children, and the elderly, at least 260 persons were imprisoned here from Friday, the 1st of May, 1940, to the next evening. While they continued here, they were forced to hear the destruction of their entire village. And, you know, uh, one of the, there's a poem about Televolk, and for every, two Germans were killed. So for every German that was shot, they shot, uh, 60 cows each. Uh, they blew up all the fit. I mean, it's just blew everything. And Hitler was totally behind this. 
And I tried to get in touch with Joachim because he's walking me up here. <laughs> I can't remember why. Part of it is the path that people took um, uh, for going down to the water. So um, this is a picture of the men being marched down. And I think in this picture, I'll try to get it straight later, that he's showing that this is one of the pathways that where they, it's a very famous picture of all the men and boys being marched down to the water. This is another way that the men, I think this is the correct one. But there are different ways that he was showing me where certain things were held. And they ended up down here. And today it's just this really nice boathouse. But back then it says a boat carrying the Gestapo officers and their Norwegian collaborators docked here on the morning of April 26. Five of them went up to the house of Martin and Lawrence. Tell her where the tragic exchange of bullets would take, took place. Four days later, on April 30th, a group of high-ranking German officers arrived here by speedboat, the Hellestad. Among them, Joseph Tobobin, National Commissioner of German Forces, and the leader of the German security forces, Heinrich Fellas, who was the monster. It was also the departure point for the boats departing with all arrested citizens of Telebog. So this is where uh, the women also left on their boat. The after the war, I was trying to find a picture after the war. This was a major high, high of mind that they were going to restore uh, Telebog. So starting after 1946, funds were raised. They hired national architects to come in and rebuild this. Even uh, King Hoken and the Crown Prince got involved with this. So the school was built in 19, finished in 1949. And what's interesting, like a lot of places, even here in the United States, schools are being closed. The school was closed because uh, the kids are now taking a bus elsewhere, partly because they don't have that many kids, you know, going to school in the area. But it's, uh, this was built um, after the after the war. And then across the street is this famous um, monument and it's dedicated to all who died at Schatzenhausen. Some of them, you know, died, some died. A couple men actually were shot there. There was a couple of people who were murdered in the concentration camp. Many of them just died of illness. So many died that first fall. And then this one here at the very bottom, it says, in Trandum, which is just outside of um, out of Oslo. It's a park that you can go to. And this is the son of um, Lawrence and um, Marta Tella. And he was executed. Uh, interesting, Martin Moritz Tella was held at Greeny. He never went to Schatzenhausen. I don't know why. Uh, but um, there's a video you can watch through NRK. And the overbeats go with uh, her husband survived. And he was one of the men that worked with um, uh, Lawrence Tella with the Shetland bus and North Sea traffic. And this is what it looked like probably the year that it was dedicated. So after this, you know, I'm, I'm now my friends, <laughs> They had driven up the taken the ferry the day that same day, came up and met me. They thought they would not, just not spend the night. I said, You should spend the night. No, they were just gonna all do it one day. So we turned around and headed down to Bumbleo. And Bumbleo is about two hours south by electric ferry. And so uh we headed down. Um, this amazing it looks like the mouth of a whale. Uh, this thing closes to hold all the um you know, hold all those cars. And we have ferries all over Washington State. That's how I get out to some of the islands. But I never seen anything like this. I think these parts up here are part of the charging system. And I don't know if the if the ship comes in and touches something and then it's charged, but it was a very nice flight down there. So where is Bumalo? Uh and the thing that was so astonishing to me, I had no idea. This is one of the most major places for Shetland bus. But um, it's down here, south of here. We took uh, a ferry from Hanyam. And uh, there on my spy map, that was very active there. They also had a little one over here called Fus in the 1942 map that I have. But we came down here, and uh, once we got there, uh, we, we arrived here. So we had a trip right down through here to Ramasdat. 
and got off. And then we went all the way to Melling. So my friend's name, Agnar Melling, many Norwegians, you know, are named for where they were born. And his family had been there a very long time. So here's like an example of um, where Bumlow is. And you can see they had 21 sorties there from Shetland. The, the next highest one is um, up here to Flora District and a couple here. There are a few way up north. I knew about the ones in Trunyam. The Hitra was there several times, the Hitra Islands and Smula, so I have that in the novels. So I know they were there. But I thought you'd like to see this. This is from, you can now, see a lot of things have now have become available. You can actually find online the actual records, with stuff that was top secret. Like XU, the, uh, the organization that was the intelligence, they were not allowed to say anything for 40 years. And just recently, this was released. But this is a Shetland bus. It shows what it is. It's going to Mellingvog on Bumlo. It left. They are selling. So look, it's really almost a turnaround. It's almost a straight shot to Shetland from Bumlo. Stunning. Over here, it says they picked up refugees. They got nine, and it was successful. Uh, and then over here, something happened here. It was not successful. Something about the refugees were gathered somewhere wrong, you know. Something happened, so they were not picked up. The vessel was a Vita, so this is a fishing boat, and this is also a fishing boat. So this is uh, looking out from the, my room in uh, Melling, and it's straight shot to Shetland. This house down here had a wife whose husband had to escape and go to Shetland. And so she was arrested and interrogated by the local police in uh, Bumbleau, which is the main little town, and um, and then returned. And after the war, he felt so badly because she was treated really badly. But you get a sense of this area here, lots of hiding places, lots of islands. And I just had, again, this is looking down from my porch. I heard sheep all night long. And now it's like June 21st, so we're really hitting. In fact, I went to a Johannes Day celebration down in Millingvog, which was really fun with live music. But every day we went walking and they were showing me all kinds of places. These islands, the Germans occupied them, but the Norwegians knew them really well. So you could hide people that were coming or waiting for the Shetland bus. Uh, this place in um, Bronson, Lonhandel, this place, um, was occupied. This whole area now you can get to it by a bridge, which I think the bridges started building in the 1990s. Prior to that, it's all little little boats or little Inner Ireland ferries. But this place was occupied. But it's fun to go into a real lamb handle and see all the stuff that's in it. This place across the way, there's another one across the water that we went to, and they have all kinds of stuff in there. This is what it looked like in the 1940s. So very bare. The only way you get around is by your boat. And remember, gasoline is rationed during World War II. So very, uh, very interesting. We walked many, many. Every evening we walked, which was wonderful. So I wanted to show you this because they one of my last couple nights I was there, they wanted to take me there. So we're, we're going all over the hills. There's sheep everywhere. And they took me to this spot. So it's a Walden area that... Uh, in the 1700s, they had a huge cholera outbreak here. And so all the villagers, everyone who died are buried here. There, I, there's over, there's at least 80 people buried here, maybe more. And uh, so they wanted me to see this. And then we walked over to the corner to this spot where there's a hole. So one of the stories that they were telling me is that on the very first day of the invasion, remember all the major cities are being hit by the Germans. But there's little things that are happening, you know, places that were not major places. Well, a German German washed up on the shore, and he's wearing a uniform. He may have been in a he may have been a down pilot, uh, but he, and so they didn't know what to do with him because remember, there's no authority yet. The Germans really haven't reached out to these smaller places, so there could be resistance going on. 
Uh, but they uh, they went to the mayor and said, what should we do with that? And then the next day they found another body. So they buried them here. Then they buried them properly. You know, they had coffins made for them. They were buried there. And then once authority was established in the region, then they were taken out. But it's one of these, you know, landscapes are so interesting because they tell stories that you don't know unless a person is going to show you. Another place was here. Um, this could be a hiding place. It goes deep underneath this crack. And, and a Shetland bound people could have been hidden there, but particularly telling me a story of a 14 year old who said something gross to one of the soldiers and, you know, insulted him and they wanted to arrest him. So he hid there for several, several days. And they never found him because the Germans just did not know the islands. They did not know. And this is Melling Vogue. So this is where the Shetland boats came in. These fishing boats would come in here. Probably, probably many, many times to this place during the war. <clears throat> and I wanted to tell you this last story because um, the partner of my friend's brother, her father was involved with the Shetland bus south of there. And his job was to, <clears throat> was to um, have everybody get ready. He would help organize the refugees and made sure they got safely on the coming bus. So what he would do, he would get a postcard like this. This is a 1930s postcard. And it would say like, oh, we just had the best time. And can we do it again? It was this flirty little message on the postcard. But it was, it said, get ready. We have refugees coming. Some of them could be agents. Some of them could be people in trouble with the Gestapo. Get ready. So he would get ready. He would leave for maybe a couple of days. Make sure it was proper. Make sure the paperwork is proper. And then he would make sure they got on the Shetland bus. And those were probably in those early years, they were fishing boats that were going over. And so uh, this went on, I don't know, maybe a year and a half. And um, his wife found a postcard. She was also getting suspicious because he was leaving, you know, a couple of days at a time. And so she thought he was having an affair. And he did it a few more times. And finally, she threatened to divorce him. And so he told his superiors, I can't do export anymore. I can't export people out anymore. So he stopped and probably in good time because some of these operations were always being found out. So many years later, when she passed away, I think in 2000 or in the 1990s, he got together the grown children. And he said, I have to tell you something. I couldn't tell you why your mother was alive. But uh, and they went like, oh, dad, we know about the affair. You know? And then he told them what he had done and they were just blown away of his courage and he always felt badly this woman said but he couldn't tell his wife he felt so badly he had to keep it secret but he said you know she would have been so proud of me that she would uh accidentally give something away and he just couldn't tell her one final thing is that in the bumble in the church the plea was one of the worst um Shetland bus accidents where they set off from here and I think they were lost at sea or they were attacked but like 40 I think 42 people lost their lives so I don't know if Agnar knew about much about this but it's right by the church in Bomlo in a park and um, I thought that was pretty amazing so that's it I did it <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm sure we all have a lot of questions, but one comment I just, I think is important to remember when people were involved in this action, they weren't just endangering their own lives, but they're endangering their family's lives too. Yeah. Even if the family didn't know anything about it, it was the Germans weren't real careful about, um, I mean, you know, they would, take very broad retribution. So uh, people were taking real gambles, not with their lives, but with their, uh, with their family's lives. Oh yeah, they were there. And they really start really 1942, really the drugs started cracking down. They always kind of, you know, the 
Norwegians would be happy to see them there. But no, and really bad things started happening at 42. All through the month, by the end of I think November in Trondheim, they declared martial art because there was so many uh, people resisting. You know, of course, that's Henry Oliver Vinn area, but uh, it got really vicious up there too. But people were, the churches are, you know, the, we had a wonderful talk a couple of years ago about the teacher strike. And uh, it's, they, all the different, there. I have a picture that's from the, I think it's from the Bergen University collection. I actually have pictures of people being searched for their good coming in. I think they're actual pictures taken down in the archives at the Bergen University archives. And then another one are people being arrested on the street in Bergen for uh, protesting, just holding up signs, protesting the teacher strike, supporting them. And they were arrested. So I really I admired them so much, seriously. I, I can write about it. I think I'd be a total chicken. <laughs> it's so hard, you know. But I sure admire them. Does anybody have any questions? I do. This is Shelley. Hi. Shelley. I wanted to ask, uh, did, the, did the Germans ever try to attack Shetland or Skyway? Yeah, there are records. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, 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 my memory's not really good. But yeah, there were actually several attacks very close. To, there was a major attack in Larrick. In fact, the building we were having the Shetland R thing in, there was a, because they had a, what is it, what are they called, MTBs? So this was another part of the British, um, you know, the Navy. They were stationed in Larrick, and there was attack there, and a number of people lost their lives. And I think one of the reasons they moved from Lunavo, there was an incident further out, and they decided they'd be more secure in Scalway. Uh, they could keep it more. They felt that there was more exposure. Because remember, they're facing the North Sea side at Lunavo, and on the Scalway side is in the Atlantic. So they might have a little more protection there, though both places are pretty wide open. But yeah, and you know, a number of people were attacked, you know, a number of boats were sunk, or they barely made it back in a row canoe. There's one case, I can't, maybe there's a barricone. And the, two of the men were shot, one did die eventually, the other one survived his wounds, but they were sunk at sea. And then the amazing courage of these people who were skippers, that just for, you know, the hardy Norwegian fishermen that uh, could handle saving people on a rowboat and literally row until they're picked up. One group, was, I don't think they ever survived. They found them dead. So they were attacked. The Germans started. And that's why they went to the submarine chasers, because they were fast. One of the fun comments is that they had refrigerated water. <laughs> so you still have a crew of these Norwegian fishermen. Now they're on these fast moving boats. I think the I think the Hitra was attacked, or it was the Hesse was attacked near one of the fjord up near uh, Trondheim. But um, that was more near the end of the war. But yeah, the Germans, you know, they were, they started catching on. And actually, you know, we had to talk about Horten a couple of years ago. Uh, and um, the Hitra is housed there now, but actually Televoke, I have discovered over the years, the discovery of Televog led to all this breakdown all the way to Oslo about these different groups because one of them was Thor Tor. He had come earlier to Televog and he was supposed to set up a, a line working with Oslo. And he ended up, um, he was shot going to his girlfriend's house in uh, drama and he ended up um, kind of giving details away. And the, the thing I don't understand is that he did eventually get out of Norway kind of acting as a double agent and he made it back to SOE Norway and continued to train people. But that's how the Hal Fortune gang was found out. I mean, so 42 was a year. Just awful. So Janet, also how how did the um Shetland folks know? Did somebody know somebody who knew somebody? How did they know that there was a need to save people and to get them supplies and 
ammunition and everything. How how did this great communication to help each other come about? Well, I think again, a lot of this stuff I always call the resistance organic in the first first couple of years. And so many of them were found out, like the Steam Group in Bergen. That was uh that was a group that worked in the shipyards. And there was another group also. They were found out. Actually, my friend um Barrett here in town, her cousin worked at the Marine Holman, and they were in a group. That could have been the Steam Group or the Old Boy Group, but they were maybe a hundred people in that, and they all went by numbers. But there was a quizzling in that group at the shipyard, and they were found out. So her her uh, cousin was sent to concentration camps. His last one was Dachau, before he was released. But um, yeah, people were found out. I just lost my train of thought, but. Yeah, so it's organic. And uh, so like what like the Telus and the Overbeat and Teleboat, I think like the third day after the news got out that the invasion was on, they were taking people to Shetland. They did many, many runs on their own. And there was a group up in Ulison, the Ulison boys that were captured in February 1942. They ended up being executed in Trondheim for Televolk. And uh, but that was the Henry Oliver Rennan operation, one of his first ones. But again, that was organic. And so different regions were they were all on the West Coast and they're all doing their own thing. And, and the, the British started organizing stuff in the summer of 41, saying we need to organize because they call, they just called it the North Sea traffic for a long time. The idea of the Shetland bus name came out, you know, eventually. But originally, it's different groups jumping in boats, rowboats. Remember, we've had a talk about people who rowed all the way to. I mean, it's just astounding. I mean, I get, I've been on a, I've been on a schooner out here in this area, but uh, you know, in a, but I've never, and I've been off ferry. I've been on an ocean liner going across from New York to, uh, to uh, France because I was a student back in the '60s, and we went by ocean liner. But to the courage of going, and we came back in a horrible storm. So when I think about people in their fishing boats taking refugees, and so to answer your question, the British start catching on. Well, why don't you go pick up so and so, and then you can go uh, and and take this with you. And they, uh, I also have other records um, showing the messages. Um, all these are available now. Um, is showing the messages of you know arms captures around Televolk. And during the fort 1942, a lot of the, they're drop, they're starting to drop stuff off. Some are also coming by boat. So they're trying to organize it and they're working with different groups. But you're right, you it's all based on trust. And I was told right away one of the first interviews I ever did was that the fifth freedom is trust. Because he's told me you could not trust your own brother. So how do you how do you lay stuff out and trust people that okay I'm going to be holding these arms they're coming in it's just astounding but it becomes more and more organized you know after about 43 there's more help coming from England they're helping the local groups but in the beginning it's organic it's just it's the wanting to do something and my narrator I have a wonderful narrator I'm hoping that he can talk to you guys because his mother was Miss the city of Oslo, I think 1938. And she had been to the States, but she worked in a huge major uh, fishing built, shipbuilding company. And she ended up being a spy. And so, and then he met uh, Chris's mother in, uh, he um, father in Scotland. He was an RAF pilot. So Chris has just written the book kind of based on all that. But he also said he, his, his grandfather actually was pro-Nazi, probably a member of the National Somling. But others, so there's stories like that too. And her group was very organic. It's just the shipbuilder saying, we got to do something. Uh, the radio operator was killed. And then she had to flee to Sweden and then get to England, where eventually she met Chris's dad. But um, so it's organic. And then it becomes more organized. Thank you. Uh, 
but um, it, uh, first of all, I'll make a comment. I just finished uh, reading the book, The uh, Bristling Code, and I have to highly recommend that to everybody. Uh, it's an excellent book, and I think it's, uh, my opinion, I think it's uh, the best of your three books about the Norwegian resistance, although all of them are very good. So I hope uh, people will get a chance to uh, purchase that at our festival coming up. Uh, but I think one of the things, and you mentioned this in one of your books, is that no matter how badly the Germans were treating the Norwegian, the Norwegians insisted on a um, fair trial for all the Germans accused of war crimes. And I think that's sort of impressive given the fact uh, how badly the Norwegians were being treated during the war. Yeah, that was uh, when I went to the Justice Museum in Trondheim, I was researching the Quisling factor because I was just interested in the prison trial, which was Norway's most expensive trial until the, the guy killed all the kids you know, on the island. But um, it was the most expensive trial, and he was like Norway number two. Uh, criminal. So that was uh, that was what I told. I spent about four hours at the Justice Museum with um, Knut Severson. He's a retired uh, uh, policeman, but he's been fascinated and actually have interviewed people since the 60s who were involved with that. And he said that was the thing, is that, you know, under the Germans, if you were German or maybe an NS member, uh, you might have a chance if you got in trouble to be, have a trial. But a lot of if you were a Jew or if you were Norwegian, the resistance, you know, forget about it. And often what's called N and N, Nachen Nobel, which means uh, fog, night and fog. And you literally disappeared. There were a couple of people that were sent from, uh, from Tel Aviv. And one of the guys who came home, you know, he's emaciated and all that after his time. And, in the concentration camp, he found out that he had been on that list. And so what that means, there's no trial. They can get rid of you anytime they want. Uh, so Knut was telling me that, you know, Norway would want to establish the law. And that meant for you had the worst person, you know, Henry Oliver Brennan was a monster. He was a psychopath and narcissist, probably the worst combinations you can have. And he, um, he honestly thought he would get off, but they, they gave him the best lawyer in town. He's gonna, you're gonna have a chance to, uh, all the people, so all over, were the guys that were tried in Bergen, they were all lawyers and have evidence. I got to handle the Trondheim, uh, you know, Rinnan's evidence, it's a huge book and it lays everything out every indictment, there's like 63 indictments against him for what he did, all in his book. And uh, that I, that was another interesting thing about, because the other thing too, that on the main one, they're lynching people, there was chaos. And the Norwegians didn't want to have that. In fact, one of the early things I was researching, I was so curious that if they, when any Norwegian came over, they had to go to the patriotic school, which was located somewhere in southern England. And you it was essentially they were quizzing you, who are you? Tell us about yourself. You know, trying to figure out if it's this a um, maybe someone slipping in who shouldn't be slipping through. And they did catch people in that way. But at the same time, they're also notified, so and so did this in my little village. And then another person came in. This person did this in my village, from the same village. Historians always work rule three. We try to have at least three something or others that tell us about an event. And when they hit the three, the, three, the people writing this, they kept records for after. And if they had more than three people saying the same thing, okay, this is a person of interest that we need to look into after the war. And that's what they did. So. so it wasn't just one person with a grudge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Linda? 
So just as a side note or a personal note, my father was 14 in northern Norway, Buda, when oh, yeah. his town was bombed by the Germans. Oh, yeah. My grandmother's home was occupied by the Germans. And my mother's uncle in Savanger, Radar Kvaman, who was a big soccer player, went to Berlin Olympics, was in a concentration camp. So I really, really appreciate your talk tonight because it showed that we were there and we still have context and contacts. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Linda. I appreciate that. I'd like to say thanks, Janet. I saw one of your uh, meetings uh, during COVID a few years ago, um, and that's when I first heard of the Shetland bus at all, and uh, read read the book. And right. <laughs> oddly enough, I was in Bergen and Televog this summer at the same time you were. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. But I wouldn't have gone. I wouldn't have known, and I wouldn't have gone. Yeah, you're the one who told me about that. Yeah, that really that really touched me. And you know, I love to see museums tell their story, and um, I'm hoping that people will take the time to drive out there. It's about a 70 minute drive. You know, it's um, you can get a little, you know, pancake out there and coffee if you're hungry. I didn't know if there was anything in town as far as a cafe, but. I want people to go out there because that's a story. I think it has to be told. And it's it's really funny. It really was a spiritual journey to go there. I mean, both, I mean, it's I I can't I can't say enough about how people help me and they want to tell the story. So I want to support the museum in Tel Aviv. I want to support the museum in Scalaway. And, um, you know, all these little places that are trying to tell the story, because you need to keep hearing the story. And actually, uh, years ago, I was reading about Ronneberg, you know, the, the heavy water raids. And he said, you know, he didn't say anything for years. You know, he's just living his life. He got involved with public and radio and TV, which I thought was intriguing after the war. What do you do after the war when you're doing all this stuff? Well, you... You go into public radio, you know, I'm just fascinated by that. But he said that in the 70s, kids were asking questions and they didn't know this history. So that's when he started going out and talking, not about himself, but just talking about that. And that was the same way this gentleman, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. I, they had him write it down on a piece of paper, but um, he is the same thing there is that, you know, his his father, who was a young man, like in college, these college kids are running this teatra. You know, it's just amazing the courage of people. And, uh, you know, they want to tell that story in tiny little places. So I want to support that museum. And actually, the Gestapo Museum, they can you can go on live, go through Facebook because they do live um things. I watch some kind of presentation. You know, I'm doing Duolingo Norwegian. So my my Norwegian reading is getting really good. I can really start hitting um, documents, but I'm also listening. And it was some talk, but they do have talks that you can uh, listen to through the Gestapo Museum. They're a wonderful group of people. And the young man that was sitting in the room there at the Tea, he's their new intern. It was so interesting. He, I think he's just 21. He's really interested in learning this history. And we have to encourage people to tell their stories. I mean, to know Barrett, who's 99, and her mind is so sharp. I just saw her two, we just had our Nordic fair about two weeks ago. Her mind is so sharp. And I could just lay pictures out. I can lay out my spy map. <laughs> And she's just ticking stuff off. Yeah, you took the ferry here. It took me 20 minutes to get over. She worked for Photomark. And here's an interesting story because Bill and I were talking about what am I going to do next? Well, the interesting is what is next? You know, and my, if I could, I, I do want to continue the stories, but she was telling me she worked for Photomart, which is probably no longer there anymore, but it was on the main drag, that Melling thing that takes you right down to the harbor. And it was constructed for fire break. But it's pie shopping goes on there. But back then she worked for Photomar. Her boss was a Quisling. He was totally in the NS. Uh, his uh, son joined the Herod. He went over and got killed fighting the Russians. And then he had a daughter. So the daughter married a German. 
and she was kicked out of the country after the war because that's what you know they're not going to tolerate that so she went to germany and she didn't like it very much so barrett is a refugee immigrant to california so she and her husband just made it over there and who did she run into she ran into the daughter and she had figured out some way to get into the united states but she's a full-on nazi i mean she took advantage of everything during those five years of occupation. So there are a lot of stories there, you know. But I'm so grateful for all the things she shared. She told me they got a monthly ration of one pound of ground meat, seven members in her family. And she said, I made the best meatballs. <laughs> she was the charge of meatballs. In fact, speaking of meatballs, my last night there, my host said, so I'm learning Norwegian. So I know shot. So it's shot. Kaka. And I'm sitting there like, wait a minute, what does meat cake look like? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out in English what they're going to have for me. And of course, they're meatballs and they're great. You know, they're thick and it has the brown gravy, which is delicious. But I was trying to figure out what the heck. And they finally started saying, we shouldn't talk Norwegian behind Janet anymore because she's understanding us. <laughs> it's fun. But, but yeah, I think. I think it's important to, to tell these stories. I mean, history almost tends to um, uh, bias towards the people who do bad things. And it's also important to to honor and respect people who are courageous in difficult times. Definitely. Yeah, so so yeah. What, do we, what do we all, hi, this is Shelly again. What, what do we all think about history repeating itself and the, um, unthinkable things that are happening currently. Well, I definitely, um, I've been I was listening to a, I think actually it was BBC. They interviewed um, a woman who lived up in the village way at the top. So they're right near the Russian border. So it's a little tiny village and you know, there's, there's a lot of pushback up there. There's a lot of things. I didn't realize that the Norwegian border up there wasn't on 1949. So there's another story. And in the last year and a half, the Russians have been kind of pushing against it. And uh, this story was on the BBC about how they used to get together all the time with the Russians. They come over for the school place and stuff like that. It's all it's all gotten really, uh, really tight. They're not talking to each other. And I've heard too that some places that were shelters in Northern Norway, they're being opened up again. I mean, people are nervous, you know. So do you do you think it's a lack of education that people don't uh, know the history of what's happened before to see that it's happening again? Probably. They, you know, I like what I think it's Mark Twain says, history does repeat your, itself. It rhymes. And those of us that study World War II, there's some things that are going on that are really troubling. And you need to speak up a, about it, you know. So, and part of it, you know, is going after journalists, um, things like that. So, thank you, Inger. Thank you. Yeah, Janet, uh, this is Jerry Erickson calling from uh, Bremerton. Well, hello. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for a great presentation. This was absolutely wonderful. And, uh, it's good to see uh, the folks from Washington Lodge. Uh, thanks, Bill, again for the invite. And uh, I'd also like to bring you all greetings from Kathy Dollymore. Uh, we were at the airport in Minneapolis yesterday, uh, leaving from the coming back from the home office, and I uh, told her about uh, the history program, and she said, "Well, make sure you say hello from me." So, uh, but anyway, uh, it. Great presentation tonight, and it's just great to be here with you and uh, look forward to the next one. Well, thank you. And Jerry, I need to come down and meet you. Yeah, we need to get together. We'll do that. Thank oh. you. Well, I guess I'd like to say um, you can probably tell how, how much into detail that Janet gets in her research. And if any of you haven't read her books, 
you really need to, um, if you enjoyed tonight, probably everybody has, but if you haven't read her books, you really need to um, to look into them. And the, the Yasing affair um, was a lot about this, this Televog tragedy. I mean, that played a role in that book. But also, um, I remember being recently on an email that Janet sent out. This is an example of the detailed research that she does for her books, where she was talking about this certain area of Norway. Do you really think that, uh, you know, are the roads really wide enough for two cars to pass each other on this part of the road? Because this is what I think is supposed to happen, but I'm not sure that it did. So, you know, she she's um she's really got her facts together and um it weaves it into a really interesting story thank you google earth is my friend now what's really fun though is to take i'll have to send you the, what the maps look like i mean they're made they're very detailed so because it was such a disaster trying to stop the germans you know i didn't know french polish and brits were trying to stop them kind of run molda area and the, the only maps they had were 1927 Baddeker. There were no maps of that area. So that's why these two volumes were put together. They were published in 1942, but literally they tell you they have maps of every single port in Norway. Uh, and then they have detailed information about roads. And so I had this map, I showed it to Barrett of Bergen and it's just all detailed where everything is all that because of the shipbuilding was huge in Bergen. It's all laid out there. And then she could scribble in her stuff. But a Google map was really fun to use too, because you'd be going along and all of a sudden you hit a tunnel. And it's <laughs> like, wait a minute, where am I? Because on the map, you're having to take a ferry. You, there's, you might take a boat. One of the ferries is no longer there. But the funny part is that when we went down to take the ferry, I was going down where I was writing about in Brisling. So I was paying really close attention to the, the landscape around, but Google Earth is pretty good, but you get do get caught in a tunnel once in a while. <laughs> so as you were speaking, I was looking at Google Earth. So thank you very much, Janet. I was totally looking at it. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's great because you can go on little walks too. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for that, Maria. I appreciate it. I do like Tori Hoglan a lot. <laughs> well, yes, and, and we, we do have some of Janet's books for sale at the festival. But, um, you know, if you can't make it to the festival, please go to Amazon. And, um, okay, well, uh, Janet, uh, well, first of all, is there any other questions or comments on the talk? Uh, it was wonderful. Yeah. I think it's a great talk. I really appreciate it. And one of the things I'll mention is that the uh, Norwegian History Roundtable, our history group, is going to be restarting in January. And one of the focus of uh, 24 is about investigating and retelling stories about Norway during World War II. Uh, rather than trying to do the whole Norwegian history, we're going to focus this year on the great stories uh, of World War II, like the ones we heard from Janet today, and try to find uh, other stories too. So that will be the focus. Uh, uh, just quick plug, we are having the annual Christmas party on December 17th. It's a Sunday. It's going to be from 2 to 5 p.m. at Norway House. Uh, this is going to be a party for everybody, uh, the kids, the adults, and senior citizens, everything. We're going to do something special for this year is that the lodge is going to provide all the food. I've told Kristen to um, uh, pull off the stops and have some great food. Uh, this will be a chance to come it down. You can do your shopping and stop by. You can come for the whole time. You can uh, come and go to a play or whatever, or activities, shopping. Uh, you can stop by for an hour or you can do the whole three hours. Uh, and we're going to have the Yulnissa for the children. We're going to have Bonnie Fife is going to be doing the songs. It should be a real nice event. And I hope uh, everyone in the lodge could attend and invite friends who might want to join too. 
So I just want to announce that. Uh, is there anyone who has uh, announcements or make comments for the group? Oh, can I say one more thing? Oh, um, sure. If you're looking for someone for roundtable, I don't know if you got the Norwegian American, but this is um, called Operation Riper. And yeah. I spent a lot of time with Frode Linderjet in Trondheim. I spent several hours with him when I was in Trondheim. And actually, um, Knut Severson told me about this. So I can get you the contact information. I think he'd um, be delighted to uh, speak. He works at the, the museum in Trondheim is actually part of a military museum association. So not like the Telebook, which is more private they get their funding from people, but this military ones, they get help, but I can get you the contact information because that would be a great talk to have them yeah. talk about that. Thanks, I, I take you. Yes, I love it. And also I want to um, uh, in, include your uh, uh, try, uh, your uh, uh, voice person. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that it. sounds fascinating. Yeah, and he says he has a he can do a, a talk. He's he's just delightful. He's a British actor. He lives in Salt Spring Island, which is just over my way. And uh, he's gonna be in England for six months, but um starting in January. But he's been on a lot of shows and TV and stuff. I'm so lucky to have him, but we really connected because of his mother. I you know, we he started asking me questions like, where did you learn about this? So stuff like that and his his book is wonderful it's called someday i'll find you because actually his father both his mother and father were um, from acting families the theater family in norway is very well known and then he belonged to a theater family the father and um he used to fly noel coward around oh wow uh, during the war so it's great stories so i'll give you the contact and i'll get in touch with um Frodo, he was so funny because he said, some people, they call me, you know, Frodo. <laughs> Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's Frodo. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for having me. I just delight, delightful. Okay. It's our pleasure. So thank you. And uh, anyone else have any comments before we close out the meeting? And well, thanks, Bill, for uh, the program you put on tonight. And Janet, uh, Everybody enjoyed that, so thanks. I will have you again, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So let's just see everybody at the festival. Um, come and help. Good night, everybody. I'll come next year. I'm thinking that maybe I should come next year for a weekend. Well, good. That'd be great. That'd be great. Please do. Please do. We can come to Please. Washington. Mm -hmm. You too, Jeannie. Come. You're welcome. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm looking at December 2nd. So. Good. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, and just maybe one more thing. Uh, Janet did a wonderful program for us uh, last month uh, on more on the Yossing affair, but uh, she tailored it to the deaf community. And we had we had um, eight members of the Lancaster, Pennsylvania Deaf Church at our meeting. And she did a wonder, Janet did a wonderful job again, tailoring it toward that, speaking about the deaf churches in Norway. So there's another talk if you ever want to hear that. Yeah. Also. Yeah. yeah I, I, I agree. I think we'll try to get a talk on that. It's a fascinating topic. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll see you at the festival and hopefully the, uh, uh, Christmas party and the programs next year. Thank you and um, have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah. Bye, right. everybody. Thank you, Janet. Bye. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Janet. Bye. Thanks, Marie. Hey. Bye. Hey.